Please join me in prayer. Holy Spirit, this morning we ask that you help us to put our trust only in what is worthy and above all else to put our trust in you who gives us life and a purpose. Amen. Now the challenge is don't be distracted by the music. We'll see if I can succeed. Once again, I'm in this situation where I had a plan for the sermon, and then um, something horrific happened and was all over the news all week uh, and has been in my thoughts all week. Maybe it's been true for some of you. Um, another, yet another mass shooting uh, that drove out of our minds the previous mass shooting that was only a few days before. Um, at this point, I doubt that you need to guess at my stance vis-a-vis -vis school shootings. Um, I've had to preach this sermon multiple times in the years that I've been here. Um, the opportunities will come up again, unfortunately. And so I decided to stay with plan A, which was to preach about something else. Um, but if you find you need to talk about events of this past week, I'm also available to do that. America is a gun. In America, we have 40% of the privately owned guns on earth. 40%. More in line with my theme this morning, America is a prison. We have 25% of all of the prison population on planet earth in this country. 25% of everyone on earth who's in prison is in prison here. For reference, we have 2% of the world's population. So 2% of the population, 25% of the prison prisoners, 40% of the guns. And this is no small feat. Prison is expensive. I mean, it costs two or three times more to keep a person in prison than it would cost to send them to college. Two or three times more for every single one of those people. Triple the cost of college. It's also cruel, uh, often needlessly so. If you meet someone who's been to prison, just ask them to describe a week, and you will hear about arbitrary cruelty uh, it's almost unimaginable sometimes. Prison is also ineffective in its stated goals. Doesn't reduce crime, doesn't make us safer, doesn't rehabil rehabilitate the majority of people who go. I learned this statistic and it blew my mind when I first learned it. I had to really understand how this works. 95% of people who are in prison never went to court. Did you know that? 95% of people in prison never went to court, never had a case, never had like lawyers arguing and exhibit A and exhibit B, none of that. You may wonder, how the heck can that possibly happen? I'll try to explain it. Um, imagine, imagine you're poor, first off, because prison is almost 100% poor people. So imagine you're poor, and you are arrested for something pretty serious, some kind of felony. Um, for, for the purposes of this example, it doesn't matter if you did it or not, okay? You're arrested for a felony, you're held for a few days, maybe a few weeks. During this time, your family's panicking, you've lost your job, you've missed payments on your car, etc. But finally, a public defender comes to talk to you. This public defender has like 400 cases this month. So they're shuffling through their folders and they're trying to get the one that's for you. And the public defender tells you, okay, you've been charged for this crime. Uh, they, they're probably gonna be able to convict you. My recommendation is that you plead guilty to a lesser crime and you'll probably be able to get off with a lesser sentence. 
If you don't plead guilty to this lesser crime, and again, it doesn't matter if you're guilty. If you don't plead guilty to this lesser crime and we go to court, they're going to charge you with something even worse. And the district attorney is going to be very angry, and they're going to throw the book at you. And if they find you guilty, they're going to throw you in, the pri in prison for a long time, as long as they can. Make an example of you. Now, your bail has been set at $30,000, which you don't have. And if you go to court, your court date is going to be in 18 months. So you will sit in jail, innocent or guilty, doesn't matter. You'll sit in jail because you can't afford to get out for 18 months. And then you'll go to trial and the district attorney will try as hard as they can to convict you of something worse. That's how 95% of people never go to court. Because given that deal, if you take this plea bargain, you can leave this week. You can be back home with your family. Or you might need to serve a sentence. It'll be a much shorter sentence, though. Mostly parole. And as a result of this, people who don't have money to pay cash bail to get out of jail while they're waiting for court plead guilty to a lesser charge. They look at the huge stack of files their, their public defender has. They think about the district attorney coming after them. And they take the deal. And so 95% of the people in prison never went to court, never had a chance to demonstrate if they're innocent or guilty. They were just arrested and charged. It's pretty mind-blowing. Uh, we do keep our prisons very full, very effectively. We have, depending on where you look and how you balance the numbers, about a two-thirds recidivism rate. That means that everyone who's released from prison, two-thirds of them go right back into prison. And you can imagine how this becomes a cycle for a large portion of people in prison. You're just in and out of prison, and eventually they just keep you because of a three strikes rule or whatever. You just live in prison now for the rest of your life. Also, many prisons are privatized. And so private prisons have contracts with the local municipalities to keep a certain population. So the private prison can make their money. So then the municipality has to keep sending them prisoners. It's in the contract. You can see how this would become a problem, I hope. So how do we do this? How do we maintain this system that the more you learn about it, the more shocking it is? One of the big ways we maintain it is through segregation. If you look at prison, almost half of the people in prison are black and about 13 or 14 percent of people out in the country are black. In fact, if you're black, you're about five times more likely to go to prison than if you're white. Similar with Hispanic people, it's about three to four times more likely. Similar with Native Americans, about twice as likely. And so the vast majority of people in prison are not white, and they came from a segregated neighborhood, and they returned to a segregated neighborhood. And so these people who are in and out of prison, if you're like, middle class or up white person, you'll never have them as a neighbor. You'll never see these people because they're kept in certain places. And so if we're going to maintain the system of imprisoning people, we have to also maintain a system of crumbling neighborhoods and underfunded schools and menial jobs with low pay so that we can funnel people into prison and funnel them right back out, but not have to deal with them not have to see the results of what we're doing. And if we're going to set people free from one of those conditions, crumbling neighborhoods, underfunded schools, low-paying menial jobs, or prison, if we're going to set people free from one of those conditions, we have to set them free from all of them, which is scary, especially because God wants us to set them free from all of them. This Sunday, we're back in the book of Revelation. I know I said we were done with it last week. I didn't lie, but I decided this text fit really well with my theme for this morning. Because we have God arriving in person in the world. And it says in the first line of the reading, God will repay all according to their works. This is an echo of what I've talked about before, the day of the Lord that's promised throughout the Old Testament. 
echoed in the New Testament, where God's ultimate victory and God's ultimate justice, whatever that looks like, is done. It's when it happens. And there's a sense that if you're waiting to live a good life, there's a point at which it's too late. There's a point at which God is like, all right, it ends here. I come into the world. I set things right. I get even, as I talk to the kids about. Insofar as there's any getting even, God does it. And so God is the first and the last, the beginning and the end, the alpha and omega. My stole doesn't match the pyramids today because I have my alpha and omega stole on in honor of the reading. And if God is the one who is to repay all according to their works. And to me, that kind of takes away the one, the one excuse we could have for the prison system we've created. Like, you could try to make the case that it's repaying people for what they've done. But that isn't our job. In our reading from Acts, God is the liberator, once again. Something God does a lot. It seems to be core to God's identity. God shatters doors, breaks chains, even sets the jailer free, if you read it. When we talk about God the liberator, when we talk about God setting us free, or setting other people free, I think we're very comfortable with the spiritual sense of that freedom or the psychological or the emotional sense of that freedom. Like God sets us free from the the fear of death or God sets us free from idolatry or God sets us free from, from sin in kind of a nebulous sense. But if you read scripture and think about it, God spends a lot of time setting people physically free. The Exodus is God setting people free in a, in a very physical sense. You were in bondage, now you're walking away. Were all of those people deserving? Were all of them morally upright? The text doesn't care. God is setting them free. God kept the kingdom of David and Solomon free from enormous empires to the east and to the west of them so that they had a chance to try and flourish. When the people were taken into exile, God set them free again from Babylon, brought them back to the Holy Land. When Jesus, in Luke 4, reads his job description out of the book of Isaiah, one of the things he reads in the book of Isaiah is that he has come to proclaim release to the captives. He doesn't specify release to the captives. And the last thing he says is to declare the acceptable year of the Lord. Once again, this year of the Lord idea that Revelation echoes, God's justice. So in Jesus' case, God's justice is restoring sight to the blind and setting captives free. When we read these texts about liberation and freedom, these, we read them with minds that are shaped by a society that has a lot of prisons and has a lot of prisoners. And I'm sure some of us feel strongly that we should have all of those prisons. And so that shapes the way we read about God setting people free. We assume it's a spiritual situation, not a breaking shackles and shattering doors and people walking out kind of situation. That's a lot scarier. One of the ways to read a story in the Bible is to ask, who are we in the story? I'm sure many of you have done that in, in Bible studies. Who are we in the story? So when I look at the, at the story from the book of Acts, and I ask, who are we in the story? Who am I in the story? I think I'm the jailer. And I think I'm not the only one. But I think I'm the jailer. Because people get testy when you talk about letting people out of prison. 
Like, if you want to lose an election, Democrat, Republican, Independent, doesn't matter, from sea to shining sea, if you want to get trounced in an election, get a reputation for being soft on crime. You're done. People get nervous when we talk about it. You may remember from the story that when everyone is set free, when all the doors are shattered and all the chains are broken, the jailer isn't calling for an alarm, he isn't asking for more guards, he isn't yelling at them to get back in their cells, he's getting ready to commit suicide. Because his whole world has just been shattered, and he knows he's going to be punished horrifically for this kind of failure, and so the best option for him is, if I can't be the jailer, I need to end it. I can't, um, he can't imagine a life where he isn't a jailer which is its own kind of prison. To think that if I'm not a jailer, I should be dead. I can't see any other option, anything else. Got to maintain this prison. If the prison breaks, I'm broken. The jailer is saved. When he sees that everything's okay for the moment, Somehow no one ran away. This is, maybe I won't be, maybe I don't have to commit suicide. And he says, what do I need to do to be saved? And he's told, put your trust in Jesus. Oh, and by the way, could we hang out at your house? <laughs> we have these wounds. Could you take care of these? And there's a baptism, if you want a baptism. We'll tell you all about it, like, over dinner. But the jailer is saved from what? Among other things, the jailer is saved from being a jailer. He's shown something else that could exist if he's not maintaining this prison. There's other work for him to do. There's another identity for him to have in the world. It's part of the shape that his salvation takes. We trust a justice system that doesn't deliver justice. And that ruins the lives of most of the people that it touches. We trust police. When one of the things we learned this past week, we're reminded that the Supreme Court and multiple federal courts have upheld the fact that the police don't have a duty to protect us. There is no legal duty for police to protect you unless you're in their custody. And we watch that play out outside that school in Texas. We trust guns to keep us safe. Man, if prison and guns kept us safe, we would be the safest people on earth. 20 times safer than other people. Can anyone honestly say that's the case? Can we be saved? Can we be saved? And if we are to be saved, what must we do? What happened to the jailer? He had to watch the, sh the prison shatter, the doors break, the chains snap, and everything just fall apart in front of him. Everyone, everyone's free to go. Paul and Silas were rooting for them. We believe they were unjustly imprisoned. What about everyone else in this prison? We don't know what they were in for. But God's indiscriminate. God shattered all the doors, shattered all the chains. So he had to watch that happen. He receives kindness from the people he had been harming. He brings them home and he binds their wounds. These aren't wounds that he inflicted but he binds them anyway. And then he is given a new identity. He's given a future beyond the prison that he was so unable to imagine before he was going to kill himself. If we can be saved, first we need to know that we need to be saved. We have to understand that we are in need of salvation. 
Salvation from trust in prisons. Salvation from all the things they represent to us. Salvation from all the things that prisons require of us to do and to let be done and to close our eyes and our ears while they happen. We need to instead trust God. Trust that God will repay everyone according to their work. And that sometimes God is going to break doors and break chains. Sometimes God is going to call upon us to bind the wounds of people we haven't hurt. And then, when the doors are broken and the chains are broken and the wounds are bound up, then we can receive our new identity. A new future that we couldn't imagine where we're not maintaining a prison. Instead of being jailers, we could be something else. Amen.